This is the United States of America. And as we had learned in the previous episodes, it is a land of many flags. A nation where every state has its own flag, as well as almost every county, and almost every city or town in those counties. That's a lot of flags. In the first episode, we looked at flags along the East Coast. Then in the second episode, we moved west to the central US. And now, we're gonna look at flags across the American West. We also learned what makes a good flag and a bad flag. And we also learned that I don't follow the rules of what makes a good flag and a bad flag, but it's a good basis to start from. But to rejog your memory, these are the rules according to the North American Vexillological Association on how to make a good flag. Number one, keep it simple. A flag should be so simple that a child can draw it from memory. Number two, Use meaningful symbolism. A flag's images, colors, or patterns should relate to what it symbolizes. Number three, use two or three basic colors to limit the number of colors on the flag. Four, no lettering or seals. Never use any type of writing or any kind of organizational seal on a flag. And number five, be distinctive or be related. Avoid duplications of other flags, but use similarities to show connections if warranted. So with that in mind, let's check out some more Flags of American Cities. Roswell, New Mexico, the county seat of Chavez County. And if you see anything weird, keep it to yourself. Roswell is known for being a little bit different than the rest, as you'll quickly notice from their flag. After a year-long competition in 1997, the city of Roswell chose a new flag, and it was designed by a local by the name of Stephen Fleming. The flag was inspired by the land, the lack of water, and the sky. At the very center, we have a Native American sun, setting behind the mountain of Capitan, just like in real life. That sun is also known as the Zia symbol, which is on the New Mexico state flag. This little white dot is a UFO. Okay, no it's not. Darn it. It actually symbolizes the heavenly stars above and all the unknowns out in the universe. And all the blue behind that is obviously the sky. At the bottom of the flag, we have these stripes. And according to the creator, they were set up this way to look like geologic strata in the ground. At the very top of those stripes, we have the yellow, which represents the plains of the Pecos Valley. The green is for the agriculture within the valley. And the blue is for the Pecos River. At the bottom we have red, which is the dirt, the rock, everything beneath the city of Roswell. Overall, I think it's a pretty fun flag, it's kind of quirky, and it's got a lot of southwestern influence in it. It definitely has a lot of character, and definitely represents the city of Roswell pretty well, because it is a quirky place. Mesa, Arizona, Arizona's third largest city and a suburb of Phoenix. Mesa, Arizona's flag is sort of new but kind of not, because it originally started life as a banner at conventions and trade shows. But thanks to the East Valley Tribune newspaper, in 2004 they decided to hold a flag designing contest for the city. There were 131 entries, and the winner turned out to be that banner used at the convention center. So in 2005, it became the official flag for the city of Mesa. Symbolism's quite straightforward and simple. We got a yellow mesa, a blue sky, and a sun. And inside that sun is a saguaro cactus. A prized symbol of Arizona and known throughout the world. These bad boys can grow up to 40 feet tall. So there you have it. A rather simple but effective flag for the city of Mesa. And I think it looks really nice. It definitely makes me think of a desert community. And I think we can all agree it's much better than the old flag. Yeah, It's like a flag for a business. At the southern tip of the state of Utah, we have the city of St. George, Utah. It is quickly becoming one of the fastest growing cities in Utah, and for good reason. It's got some stunning scenery around it. Not to mention several national and state parks, all within an hour's drive. Prices for a home are much lower in St. George, and you get to avoid the West Coast politics. But we're here for a flag, and boy do they have a flag. Or something. You see, in 2016, the city unveiled a new logo. The logo would appear on their cars and letterhead and all that kind of stuff. But then the following year, that logo became the flag. In 2017, the mayor, John Pike, explained what the flag means. He said that the yellow logo has many meanings, including it being the sun. But it also looks like a cog or a gear, signifying the industry and commerce of the St. George area. It could also be seen as a wagon wheel, as a nod to the heritage to the early settlers of the area. He said that from above, it could look like people standing together in a circle with their arms open wide. 
And lastly, it's supposed to be bright, optimistic, and provide energy for the city. So does it look like a city flag to you, or does it belong as a corporate logo? I guess that's up for you to decide. Ephraim is a small town in the middle of Utah that you've probably never heard of, but they have this flag. And it becomes even cooler when you realize this flag was made by a middle schooler. So let's dive into this flag. In early 2020, the city of Ephraim officially adopted this to become the new flag for the city of Ephraim. It was designed by a sixth grader, and when asked what the new flag means, she already had it determined. In the very center is a white circle, and in that white circle is a tree. And that tree is located in Ephraim's Pioneer Park, and is called the Peace Tree. The bird in the center is a black hawk, representative of the Black Hawk War, which took place between 1865 and 1872, between more Mormon settlers, and roughly 15 to 16 different tribes. The exact reason for the war isn't exactly known, but it is most likely due to territory disputes. Remember that peace tree from a few seconds ago? It was under that tree that a small peace treaty was signed between the Mormon settlers and about six tribes. They agreed that there would be peace as long as water flowed in the creek behind the tree. And yes, the creek is still there. The white circle itself stands for hope and goodness. Then we also have two different colors behind the circle, blue and red. The blue and red is for Scandinavian heritage. As well, the blue stands for peace, and the red stands for excitement. Because you know as well as I, the party never stops in Ephraim. So what do I think of the flag? I think it's great. I mean, this is what makes exploring city flags fun. Who'd expect this tiny town to have this great flag made by a middle schooler? Good job. And here's an example of another flag made by a high school student this time. Margaret Overbeck made this flag in her class, and in 1926, this flag was adopted as the official flag of Denver. And this flag is pretty well known throughout the country. The North American Vexillological Association even rated this the third best flag in the United States. That's probably why there's swag for this flag, including pillow covers. When looking at the flag, you'll quickly notice a white zigzag down the middle. This actually has two different meanings. It's supposed to symbolize Colorado's Native American heritage, but more commonly, it's known as snow-capped mountains. You know, those mountains you see in every photo of Denver? Exactly. The red on the flag is for the color of the Colorado earth, the dirt and rock, while the blue is for the sky. And that leaves us with the yellow slash golden sun, and that's what it is, the sun. But it's also gold because it represents the gold in them hills, because Colorado used to have, you know, gold rushes. And lastly, the sun is in the very center, representing Denver's location in the center of the state. Eh, close enough. And that's Denver's flag, and a mighty fine one at that. We have to head through miles and miles of farmland to reach our next place in Pocatello, Idaho. All right, let's see what their flag looks like. Uh, oh, ooh, gosh. Uh, here it is. Sure glad they trademarked it because, you know, people would want to steal this. Ooh, what a lovely copyright symbol. That's what I want on my flag. Ooh, and that font. What is that from? So with a flag as beautiful as this, you might be surprised to know that this flag was ranked the worst flag in all of North America by the North American Vexillological Association. What a shock. So in 2017, when the city decided to have a competition for a new flag, this made national news. And finally, they narrowed it down to the top six flags before a winner was chosen. And that winner was this flag. Oh, uh, no, that was just a submission. This flag won. And immediately a sense of pride exploded in the city. You could even go to the city's website and buy the flag there. Or go on Amazon and get some flag swag. This was the biggest thing to happen to Pocatello since movies. So what does this new flag mean? Well, let me show you. Here, have some tots while you watch. The blue above is obviously the sky, while the gold in the star is for agriculture. The red on the flag in general stands for Red Hill, which from the top you have great views of Pocatello, plus some cool Roman style arches. The blue stripe is for the Portneuf River, while the three mountain peaks from left to right are Scout Mountain, Kinport Peak, and Chinese Peak, all of which loom over the city of Pocatello. The three peaks also represent industry, recreation, and education. Meanwhile, the star slash compass on the top of Scout Mountain symbolizes the city's role as Eastern Idaho's trade and transportation hub for rail, 
road, and air. The symbol also is an abstract arrow, which acknowledges the area's Native American history. And that pretty much sums up Pocatello's flag, from its meteoric rise from worst to possibly first. Other flags are just jealous that this flag gets all the vexillologists. Gosh, Pocatello used its mad skills to make this awesome flag. And I truly think it's one of the best flags in the country. And also shows that any other city can use their mad skills to create a really good looking flag. An example of another city using their mad skills to get a good looking flag is Spokane, Washington, the financial, commercial, and transportation hub of the Inland Empire, a region made up of eastern Washington, Idaho's Panhandle, western Montana, and parts of northern Oregon. Spokane's had a long history with flags. Their first one was in 1912 and lasted until 1958, and it was replaced with this flag. That flag unceremoniously charaded around until 1975. Spokane was the center of Expo 74, the smallest city to have ever had a world's exposition. Spokane gained a lot of notoriety that year, and even got an award as an all-American city. The following year, they decided their old flag was no longer modern enough, and they created this flag. And it was exciting and new for a little bit, but quickly forgotten. It was remembered again in 1981 when a climber from Spokane reached the top of Mount Everest and held up the Spokane city flag. But then it was forgotten again, and the flags were put into storage and no longer flown out by City Hall. But in 2012, a strange move was made. Spokane's newly elected mayor, David Condon, had the flags pulled out of storage and fly again. And in some press conferences, he could even be seen with the original 1912 Spokane flag in the background. In 2019, there were rumblings that they wanted to get a new flag for the city. And in December 2019, it was official. A commission had been set up to get a new flag for the city of Spokane. But before we continue, let's see what the flag means. It's a white flag with diagonal bands of Sertrus green and aqua blue. The colors are based off the colors used on the Expo 74 logo. Inside the black circle are the words Children of the Sun, which is pretty much just saying the city's name because Spokane is Children of the Sun in Salish, the local Native American language. Just to the right of it is the sun, followed by a family of stick figures at the bottom. And then, of course, it says City of Spokane on the lower right, and that's the flag. Certainly many flag sins, but for some reason I like the color scheme. It seems fresh and clean. But back to the story. The Spokane Flag Commission opened it up to the public, and they were very serious about this new flag. They created a Facebook page, and over the course of several months had several committee meetings, and soon, over 400 submissions. And unfortunately, that's where the story stops for now. They will choose a flag in 2021. Preliminary public voting started on December 29th, 2020. I guess we'll have to revisit this subject and see what flag Spokane chose. Next, we head to Northwestern Washington to the city of Bellingham, a quirky, funky college town that was completely transformed by its new flag. Now, this city's always had sort of an independent streak, sort of its own jive going on. But when locals decided it was time to get a new flag in 2017, everyone united behind the creator, Bradley James Lockhart. Well, not before they winnowed it down to his flag. You see, there was a competition held in 2015, and in the end, Lockhart's flag won. The blue half circle represents Bellingham Bay, which the city is located on. The four green stripes also have meaning, as they represent the original towns that eventually would become the city of Bellingham. Starting with the top stripe, you have the town of Whatcom, followed by Seaholm, Bellingham, then Fairhaven. And the blue half circle also shows that Bellingham Bay unites those four towns. Also in that blue section are two stars representing two local Native American tribes, the Lummi and the Nooksack, both of which have reservations in the county. And the three wavy lines stand for Noisy Waters, which is a translation of the word Watcom from the Nooksack tribe. And if the flag is hung vertically, those lines depict Watcom Falls. And Bellingham is such a tight-knit city that they've embraced the flag everywhere. Reportedly, hundreds of businesses have the flags in their windows, hanging on poles. It's at the city hall, police department. Even the garbage trucks have the flag. And they're even selling the flag on knickknacks and paddy wax. The city government has completely embraced this flag and used it as a tourist draw, and it's working. The city completely redid their website and the color themes of the new flag. And the city's fire department? 
Well, they even changed their logo to match the colors of the flag. This is the perfect example of how a flag can rejuvenate a city and a populace and bring a new sense of pride to a city that didn't even need it. They already embraced their city, but what's cool is this flag also made a ripple effect because many other cities in the state of Washington saw the success of the Bellingham flag and now they're in the process of getting new flags too, or at least talking about a new flag. This is definitely something we'll have to follow up on. And just a prime example of how a good flag can unite. Portland, Oregon's largest city, has actually had a flag unofficially since 1905, and it's changed several times. But it wasn't until 2002 that it became official. The flag can be seen in front of government buildings and at businesses. And the flag is practically everywhere when the Timbers soccer team plays. It is waved by the Timbers army. So let's learn why Portlanders love their flag by learning what it means. So the background is green, which represents Oregon's forests. The vertical and horizontal blue stripes represent the two rivers that converge on Portland. The mighty Columbia River and the Willamette River, which runs right next to downtown Portland. If you look closely, there's a white star in the center, and it signifies Portland at the confluence of these rivers. The golden stripes on the flag symbolize grain. Since the port of Portland is an international exporter of wheat, and not just that, a major one. They get grain from eastern Oregon and eastern Washington, as well as Idaho and parts of Montana. The last bit of unfinished business is the white stripes, which actually have no meaning on the flag. This original flag design was actually created in 1969, but back then, it had a seal on the left-hand corner by Douglas Lynch. Over the next 32 years, Douglas Lynch continued to improve on his flag. And finally, in 2002, he approached the city council and presented them the new flag, without the city seal. And it was approved. In 2004, the North American Vexillological Association ranked the Portland flag the seventh best flag in the United States. So wave your flag proudly, Portland. I know you will. Salem is Oregon's capital city and sits in the Willamette Valley, Western Oregon's agricultural heart. But when you're in Salem, you kind of forget that because it's the commercial hub for the area, as well as the government center of Oregon. In 1972, the city had a contest to design a city flag, and after looking at all the submissions, designer Arvid Orbeck created this, and it became the official flag of Salem. The star in the center indicates Salem being the capital of Oregon, while underneath that star in the green section is the top of the capitol building, with the Oregon Pioneer landmark sculpture on the top. The green stands for freshness and hope, the blue is for sky and water, the white is for peace and honor, and the yellow is for harvest, nature's bounty and fulfillment. And so you won't forget what city this is for, it says Salem on it. It was ranked the 51st best flag in the country. But that's not good enough because a local wants to have the flag changed. And he created the Salem Flag Project where anyone can send submissions for what they think the flag should look like. And there's already a lot of submissions from adults to kids. By summer 2021, they plan to have a review process where people get to rate the flags, and hopefully, by late 2021, they will present the flag to the city council, and maybe have a new flag for the city of Salem. California's capital city, Sacramento, has a flag that reminds me of a shopping mall logo from the 1990s, or a very generic design that would be used to cover up an abandoned storefront. This is Sacramento's modern art. Or flag. And so you would know it's there as they write their name on the bottom there. And so few people even know they have a flag, since it's not flown anywhere, a local news agency had to write an article on it. Twice. And here's the sad thing. This flag's an improvement over their old flag. So the current flag has two blue sections, representing the city's two rivers, the Sacramento River and the American River. The green stands for agriculture, while the gold represents the gold miners that were so important to California and Sacramento as a whole. I mean, they were front and center during the 1849 gold rush to California. Then we have white down the middle, sort of shaped like an S. Some people say that's an S for Sacramento, but that's actually not official. The white stands for virtue, strength, and a bright future for Sacramento. And that's the flag. Again, you won't find it anywhere in the city. It was designed by two different departments within the city in 1989, but neither of them exist anymore. And there haven't been really many calls to replace the flag. I found this result from 2017, but doesn't seem like anyone's that interested in changing the flag. So for the time being, Sacramento has this flag to never see. We head to California's Inland Empire, and this will be short and sweet for the city of Fresno. A contest was held in 1962, and the winner would get a $250 prize if their flag was selected. And a winner was selected, Lanson Crawford's design. 
The flag is a different set of colors compared to most flags, a unique tricolor of brown, blue, and green. The brown is for the fertile soil of the Central Valley. The blue is for blue skies and a mild climate, while the green is for the trees and the green fields. The sun in the green section also stands for the sunny days, which breathe life into the orchards and fields around Fresno. The ash leaf in the center recalls the origins of the city name. It's the Spanish word of Fresno, which means ash leaf. And that ash leaf sprouts out of the word of Fresno, which is brown like the color of dirt, signifying growth and that life sprouts out of Fresno. And the leaves point equally to the sun symbol and the industrial cog on the left, symbolizing the fine balance between nature and industry in the valley. The white around the sun and the white gear also symbolize snow in the Sierra Nevada mountains, which provide water for the valley and all of its agriculture. The North American Vexillological Association ranked it the 36th flag in the United States. And while it's not the worst flag, it's definitely not the best flag either, but I do give it props for using its unique color scheme and having a lot of symbolism. And we're going to end it here with Los Angeles' flag. With what seems to be a theme throughout the United States, the largest cities don't have that good of flags. I don't think this looks good. Sure, it's a little unique in the sense it has jagged edges, but I don't like it. Front and center, we have a very complicated city seal that nobody would be able to draw by memory. At least draw it good. On the top left, we have the Great Seal of the United States. While on the right, we have the Flag of California, or an approximation of it, you can see the bear. On the left, you have the coat of arms of Mexico, while on the right, you have a tower and a lion for the Kingdom of Castile and the Kingdom of Leon, representing the arms of Spain. Around the seal, it tells us the name of the city, as well as the year it was founded. The major crops of California are also shown. At the very top, we have grapes, followed by olives, and then oranges. And those fruit are bordered by a 77-bead rosary, which represent the Spanish missions in California. The flag is made up of three colors, green for olive trees, gold for orange groves, and red for vineyards. The same thing that's also on the seal. The colors also represent Spain and Mexico. Gold and red for Spain, and Mexico with the green and red. The flag was adopted in 1931 and was ranked 33rd by the North American Vexillological Association. Some people like it, some people don't. But I think we can all agree, it's better than the Los Angeles County flag. Oh my goodness. And that's all we got as we toured the United States from east to west and looked at flags from cities big and small. And don't worry, if you didn't see your flag, most likely it's coming in the future because I see a series coming on. But until then, thanks for watching. And remember, fly your flag high, America.